Monday night edition of the Anaheim Calling Podcast. We are here to discuss a thrilling matchup tonight between the Ducks and the Vancouver Canucks. We're going to talk about that for a little bit, but let's be honest. We all know what we're here to talk about. Today was the NHL trade deadline. It was crazy. The Ducks made trades over the weekend. We're going to talk about that. It's going to be a good time. Jake, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited for this pod. I mean, I don't know what you're talking about with this trade deadline thing. I mean, the most interesting part of the day was uh, AHL transaction watch. <laughs> I mean, maybe for you. Actually, I know for you that was exciting. <laughs> I constantly, for the rest I of the world. I was constantly re- refreshing. I actually was too. Not because <laughs> I... For me, it's 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 more of like a fear of missing out than an actual care. <laughs> No, it was. I, I, I want to be hashtag Sicard first. Yeah, that's, it, that's, it that's wasn't a fe- it wasn't a fear of missing out for you. It was wanting to post it first and then rub it in everyone's face. Yeah, that, that's more <laughs> what it's about. Um, but it was a it was a fun day. I gotta admit, I was glued to to Twitter the entire day. It did not disappoint. There were a lot of big trades, and the NHL stretch run is going to be a lot of fun. Just don't watch Ducks games the rest of the way. <laughs> I should say that as a Ducks podcast host. But anyway. Especially a post-game podcast host where our no. content relies upon the games. No, there's actually – the Ducks actually made moves that are going to make them, to me, a lot more interesting to watch down the stretch. Not for, obviously, the sake of this season, but for the long-term point of view of this franchise. But – Let's get into the game first. We promised that we talk about the game before getting into the moves. It's going to be hard to talk about the game, though, without talking about some of the moves. Um, let's start, though, with this. So, roster movement. Daniel Sprong back in the lineup, due partly to the fact that Brian Gibbons is no longer a duck. He Our dearly departed Brian Gibbons. We, were, we barely Brent, knew ye. <laughs> Brendan Goulet. <laughs> if you hadn't heard that name before, get used to it because Brandon Goulet was in the lineup tonight on a pairing with Cam Fowler for the dearly departed Brandon Montour. I guess we just gave it away. I, I promise we're going to get into the moves, but the Ducks featured a pretty brand new lineup tonight with Kevin Boyle in net. The kids still up. Not Sam. Maybe the most controversial thing about this game. Not Sam Steele. Sam Steele was not actually still up. He was actually sent down. Yeah, he was sent down. We'll, Meanwhile, Troy we'll, Terry and we'll jump into the re- we'll jump into the reasoning behind all of it after this game. Yeah, l- let's just get through the recap. Just, just so, go, just go, just l- just pump it out. Let's just Felix. go through the recap. We we really have to. This is going to be rapid fire. So first period, Nikolai Goldovin, key addition to the Vancouver Canucks last season, gets the Canucks on the board, brings it down the right wing, fires it on net, and I. <laughs> I think Kevin Boyle is going to want this one back. I mean, no screen, no movement before the shot, just a wrister from above the circles, and it goes in on Boyle, high blocker. Not a good game from Boyle tonight. I'm sorry, it just wasn't a good game from him. I'm not saying it cost the Ducks the game because they couldn't put one behind Jack of Markstrom, but that goal would kind of set the tone for the night. Alex Biega would just rip a shot. This one, I think that you can you can give Boyle a bit of a pass. I think that it he may not have been able to see it, but the replay isn't very kind. It, I mean, I don't know. I think that's probably one he's going to want back. Yeah, I mean, we can probably say that about most of the goals in this game, to be honest. It, it, it wasn't a banner night for Kevin Boyle. I mean, you knew that one of these was probably going to be coming from him. Um, but, but against the Canucks, though? I mean, these Canucks team, this Canucks team, this year's Canucks <laughs> team is not terrible. Let, let, I know, let me put we, it that we, way. We, we, may, we may have to start coming to grips with that. I was I tweeted about that during the game. I had this thought during the third period. I was like, man, the, the Canucks are going to be better than the, the Ducks in two years. But then I realized, wait, they're ahead of them in the standings, and they're up 4-0 in this game. Like, they're already better. Yeah. I mean, okay, but, but, but let's be serious, though. I mean, the Ducks, this Ducks team fully healthy – with not Randy Carlisle as the coach, I still think that they're a little ahead of the Canucks. 
Yeah. And and I think it's even possible based upon how this offseason goes that this team could be ahead of the Canucks in two years. Um, the thing with the Canucks that I think that's a concern. You just, you, you just made a very subtle Jack Hughes reference. Was it even, was it really subtle? <laughs> I feel like it was pretty obvious. <laughs> it was a little subtle. Um, but, I mean, I don't really love the Canucks blue line. I think they have great forward talent in, although granted Quinn Hughes is going to be coming in for them. Um, and if I'm not going crazy, he's a defenseman is a pretty highly touted one at that also. Yeah, um, he's good. And, but they have two solid lines. They've got Bo Horvat centering the first line. Then you've got Elias Pettersson who looks just insane for them. So, I mean, it's not that out of the realm of possibility. I mean, the, the Pacific division is in a weird spot where it can change over the next couple of years significantly in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I mean, it's exciting, though, because I think that the league and this may not be a popular opinion amongst our listeners, but I think that the league is a better place when the Vancouver Canucks are like a relevant franchise. I'm not saying they have to be great, but I think that they're a fun franchise. I mean, look, if they lose the cup final, their their fans nearly burn down the city like that's we need more of that in the NHL. Felix is not a proponent of people (laughs) going and burning down the city. I should add that disclaimer. uh, I'm fully advocating for anarchy at this point. Um, okay. That being said, <laughs> I've said it all on this show at this point. Um, so Bo, Bo Horvat towards the very beginning of the second period off of, you guessed it, a defensive breakdown in the Ducks own zone is able to make it three to zero. Brock Besser has all the time in the world to carry the puck into the slot and then kind of a broken play. Josh Manson, wouldn't you guess it, isn't able to clear the front of the net and Horvat is able to tuck it in. This is a power play goal. Um, Horvat would then get a second goal on the night, making it 4-0. And this one was probably, to me, the hardest one to watch just because the Ducks had an opportunity to clear the zone. The puck gets yeah. played up to Ryan Kessler, who's unable to corral it. And then he ha- and then once the Ducks, or sorry, once the Canucks keep it in, Kessler has another opportunity to then get control of the puck, loses it again, then loses a battle along the wall. Daniel Sprong is just watching the puck. He completely loses his man going to the net. Just total lack of awareness. Puck comes back to the slot, and then defensemen aren't able to cover that mistake. It ends up in the back of the... I mean, it was just... It, it was just like a comedy of errors defensively from the Ducks. But that's been the story of their season. That would make it 4-0... A little pushback towards the end. Troy Terry and Max Jones had some moments. Brendan Goulet, my boy, had some good moments. But outside Wait, of that... Wait, have, have we confirmed how we're pronouncing his name? I'm going with Goulet because it sounds more French-Canadian, even though he's probably he's definitely not. I think it's Goulet. I'm just going with... I'm going to go with Goulet. I think it's, I think it's goalie. It's not, goal, it's not no goalie idea. like a goalie. Uh, now that's, how I first, that's how I first heard it. Now I need to see if there's pronunciation anywhere. I'm going with Goulet because uh, Brian Hayward said Goulet on the on the broadcast. As if we're gonna trust Brian Hayward. I mean, wow. I mean, I mean, yeah. Okay, I can't find anything. I, I'm looking for like a Wikipedia like pronunciation page, anything that could help with this, and I got nothing. So, I guess we'll we'll have I'm to. With, I, I'm go, I'm going with Goulet for now. This this reminds me of when uh, Andre Kasha was first called up, and we were saying ca- Kase. What did we used to say? Kasa. Uh, I don't remember. No, it wasn't even. It was Casey or but, some Casey I mean, Mills. I, I don't know. I also struggled this year with Aberg and Auberg and figuring out which <laughs> way to pronounce that thing. Yeah. Well, he's no longer with us, so it doesn't matter. Oh, um, pour one out for the homie. Takeaways from this game. Takeaways from this game. Um. Ducks controlled shots uh, and expected goals and lost. Not that good. Uh, as you can see, oh, give me a second. It is not. They good. generated no offense. Yeah, that's the issue with tonight's game is that. Against against a Canucks team. I'm not going to say a bad Canucks team. I'm just going to say a Canucks team. A Canucks team. Um, yeah, so it, it's a night where I think per shot metrics, you'd say it was a decent night. Although, as you can see, the Canucks started to take over the game near the end of it. and um, But the Ducks overall had some decent shot numbers. But where it really kind of struggles to uh, come into play is if you look at more so expected goals type metric. Uh, and you see the Ducks had a 1.82 expected goals to 1.85 for the Canucks. 
And so the Ducks did a decent job in the beginning controlling some shots and getting some chances, but for the most part it was kind of all to the outside. And then they kind of, by the end of the game, just kind of sort of gave up. And you can see this heat map. The Canucks scoring chances on this one are kind of from all over the place. The Ducks had a couple in front of the net, and you there's the big one that's the Max Jones play where he he just missed the shot. There's no other way around it. But I think it looked great. Looked great yet again. Yeah. But, uh, if you're looking at this for positives, the positives are that Fowler actually played the right hand side tonight, yes. which I think is interesting because I can remember way back when I think it was when Fowler first came into the league or maybe a couple years in, they tried putting him on the right hand side. And I can remember he was, uh, he was kind of struggling a bit with, uh, Oh, whoops. I just realized the what I was trying to show everyone was not on the screen yet. So here you go with uh, scoring chances and expected goals and those different types of things. Um, but so with Fowler, they had tried putting him on the right-hand side, and the issue that he was having was that uh, essentially when he would come to carry the puck up the ice, his head would and vision would still go to where it would be if he was coming up the left-hand side. And so he wouldn't really know where the boards were and would kind of lose track of where the space was. And it's kind of one of those things that you're so used to playing seems, on one seems side. Seems like a problem. Yeah, and so it's almost like they kept him, they've kept him on the left-hand side because of that. So I found it interesting that he was the one, and I made sure to make or take a look at this in the beginning well, of the he, game. He, he, he's the more veteran yeah. player of the two. So they had him so. on the right-hand side of, and Megna on the left-hand side to begin, and they eventually shifted him and put him with uh, Goulet. Is, yeah, there we go, Goulet. Um, and so apparently we're, we're getting some comments in the chat here that it's Gouli. Gouli? Gouli? Okay. Gouli. Gouli. I prefer Goulet, but I mean, that's just me. I just like it because it sounds French-Canadian. Yeah. Um, is it, is it, anyway. <laughs> so I and so Fowler actually did stay on the right hand side, which I thought was interesting. And those two together, um, those two looked good together. I mean, you look at the stats mm-hmm. for them on the night um, as a whole. Fowler had an expected goals four percentage of eighty in the eighties tonight. You have Goulet or Gouli. That's gonna take me a while to get right. I think it's Gouli. Gouli, uh, in the sixty-five to seventy range. And so it was a really good night for those guys. Um, the bad Lindholm Manson were really, really bad tonight. Like really a rare, bad, a rare, bad game. Yeah. So, um, overall though, I think the biggest takeaway is Gooley looked really good. And I think the initial returns are that the ducks probably immediate impact wise didn't lose a whole lot by swapping out uh Montour for Gooley. So let's just get right into it. I mean, we've 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 tried to tiptoe around this to the best of our ability and we've we've tried. But now let's just let's just go all in here. So over the weekend, Sunday afternoon to be exact, the Ducks did the unthinkable. Brandon Montour traded to the Buffalo Sabres in exchange for Brendan Gooley and a Conditional first round pick, which is actually not that conditional. The, the condition the guaranteed. Do you want the guaranteed a li- first round pick either way? But yes, please lay out the conditions. So the, the conditions are basically it's the San Jose pick, but the condition is if St. Louis ends up being in the twenty to thirty one range. So if St. Louis makes the playoffs, and essentially they're not one of the worst teams to make the playoffs, or one of the first. I believe the way it works is the teams that lose in the first two round get sorted based upon their standings and the final four teams uh, get the final four draft spots. So if the blues finish and are not 16 through uh, or yeah, 16 through 19, the ducks have the mm-hmm. option to pick either St. Louis's pick or San Jose's pick. So Basically, the takeaway from that is if St. Louis ends up in the low 20s, it's a really good thing for the Ducks because that could improve their pick almost 10 spots or so if you think San Jose makes the conference final. Well, I mean, that's that's actually kind of an open question because Vegas adding Mark Stone, the yeah. Ducks, or sorry, the Sharks adding Nyquist, that's going to be a bloodbath it is, of a it series. It is, it is. But so essentially the Ducks, anyway, the, Ducks, let, let, yeah. the Ducks have guaranteed themselves a pick in the 20s. But I mean, let's let's really like this is this is a big trade for the Ducks. I mean, Brandon oh, it is. Montour, it, it's, it's not just the fact that it was a regular defenseman in their lineup for the last years. This is a homegrown talent. This is a guy who 
played his way up through the San Diego farm system. A guy who was often referred to over the last few years, you know, when teams would talk about the Ducks, say, yes, they have their, they have that blue line with Montour, Theodore, Larson, you know, that, that crop of, 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 of D men. And now all of a sudden it's crazy to think, but guys, you know, Fontenin, Theodore, Montour, they're all gone. I mean, you know, of the, and Pedersen, they're all, all gone. I mean, of that crop, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think Vodnum's really part of that, but you, all, of that crop, only Larson remains. And I I find it kind of startling to think that they they traded him and that, you know, well, it, it, there, I, there was there, there, there was a report today, not really a report, but Brian Burke talked about this on, you know, on the broadcast for the trade deadline on Sportsnet about how uh, partners of Montour complained that he was unpredictable to play with. And obviously Burke is probably still very well connected yeah. within the Anaheim organization. So take it with a grain of salt. But it's funny because him saying that, if it's true, I don't think that that's inaccurate at all because that was some of my complaints of Montour this year was that he just seems like a hard guy to play with. He seemed like a guy who was... A, never utilized properly. We can agree on that, at least on the power play. And then I think that this year especially is what really did him in because, and I tweeted this out yesterday, he should have never been on a first pairing with Hampus Lindholm. Yeah. Never. Because being with a Lindholm, with a Lindholm type would have, is fine for Brandon Montour. I think that's the type of partner he needs. But not in those minutes, not in that yeah. usage, not in those matchups. And I think he was never put in a position to succeed. Yeah. That being said, I also think it's a bit revelatory of his true, I guess, talent level or value to a to a team. I think that he's more of a support guy. I think now we can kind of safely assume. Yep. And I, I think there's a couple things that I find interesting about the fact that he was moved. Um, I, I think the first off is he's the youngest out of this crop of current D men. He, he's the mm-hmm. youngest between Fowler, Lindholm, uh, Manson. And actually, I actually am now trying to think, maybe Lindholm might be younger than him, but still, regardless. The point is, it's shocking to me and interesting to me that he's the one that m- was moved because I always had assumed that he would be the one to stay because of his age, because of the different factors, because of the fact that he actually kind of provides a little bit of a different element to the team than a couple of these other defensemen. And so I think that's a bit shocking to me, to be honest, that he's the one that was moved for that specific fact. But I think if you were to right. break down the roster, it makes the most sense. The The team has invested a lot in Cam Fowler. For all of his detractors out there, they've invested a lot. And he's, yeah, Felix uh, raising his arms there for those of you listening to the recorded <laughs> version. Um, even for those detractors out there, we can all agree that they've put a lot of time and effort into him. And he did have a good season last year, I believe, and the year before. And so it's not that shocking to me that they want to give him a little bit of time. Now, I could be saying this and then he's moved over summer. That could very well happen. But it it makes sense on that front. The fact that Josh Manson, the Ducks probably like the type of game he has. And uh, Hampus Lindholm, he's the the one untouchable in this situation, I think. So on that front, it makes sense. On the other front... Moving Montour is a much easier deal than moving those other guys because there's less money attached to it. He's a little bit more attractive because of that purpose. And so I think that kind of makes sense. I I think it, it's just interesting to me that if you were to ask me who gets traded at the deadline, Montour would have been kind of lower on my list than a couple of other different players. Right. But I think that the thing that we weren't privy to is how the Anaheim organization True. viewed Brandon Montour. And I think that it's obvious to me that you don't trade a guy because you see him as part of your long-term plan. You know, I think that they're, they're just, there was a point whenever it was reached that they just didn't see him as part of the plan. Now, another thing that's interesting to me, and again, another thing I brought up the other day is that let's not forget last summer where Brandon Montour did file for arbitration. And although it never got to a hearing, it wasn't a Nick Ritchie level contentious negotiation. Yeah. But keep in mind that so after this season, Brandon Montour has another year on his one more year on his deal. And then he's back to RFA status 
with arbitration rights. So it appears to me that there's a couple of things at play. One, the on ice element. Obviously, that's number one. Didn't work out. I think that they didn't put him in a position to succeed and he didn't fit the bill. He couldn't deliver. Even when he was given chances, it just didn't work out. I thought that Don Luschichin had a really good point in the athletic uh, article about the trade where Montour had a lot of points last season, but that seemed to be more of a product of opportunity as opposed to true talent level, where I believe he ranked 117th in points per city at five on five per four defensemen. And then the other thing is just that I don't think that they wanted if the if if the relationship had indeed been a little soured, I don't think that they wanted to go back down the rabbit hole again. I think that we've seen this time and time again in the NHL where you have a bridge deal and it kind of it just makes things a little more awkward. PK the next Subban? time around. PK Subban, Alex Galchenyuk. Yeah. I mean I am very familiar with this world. You, you have the notorious one of uh, Patrick O'Sullivan with the Kings, where he took the king, or he went to arbitration, and the Kings traded him right afterwards. Uh, James Wisniewski with the Ducks. That was Bob Murray. Yeah. Went to arbitration, traded him right away afterwards. Yeah, I mean, you have to listen to your employer tell you why you're not worth yeah a certain amount. I uh, mean, I can't imagine having to do that with my job. Yeah. Right. So imagine yeah. being a player that must be awful. Yeah. Well, now it's part of the business and you get to live as a millionaire, but that's that's tough. Yeah. Uh, a couple of interesting things, though, that I I think that this trade brings up and it's also included in this trade. Um, it's funny how the Ducks kind of defense has gone or the depth within the system has gone away over the years. It's because. Oh, it's with, it, it, it's it's gone. It, it's ba- it's basically right now. It's Josh Mahura and Jacob Larson, and that's kind of it. I mean, unless we want to consider uh, Gooley as part of it now or if he's on the roster now, depending on where you you put him. But kind of that's kind of left the Ducks system. And so I think that's interesting. Maybe that's a big reason why they went and got Gooley. Maybe they're not completely sold on Jacob Larson. There's a whole lot of questions that come up. But one interesting thing also is this was essentially a second-round pick for a second-round pick plus a first-round pick. In a roundabout way. Yeah. In a roundabout kind of way. And so overall, the Ducks got really good value for Brandon Montour. Yeah, I mean that and, and that's that's the takeaway here is that I think that I personally was never sold on Brandon Montour. And if you read the Eric Stevens piece on this, which I trust what he's saying when he's saying that the Ducks at one point valued Brandon Montour over Shea Theodore, and part of that is what led to them feeling comfortable shipping Theodore off. To me, that looks like a massive mistake now. Even at the time, it didn't seem like a great decision, but now it seems even worse because they're out on both those guys. All that considered, all of that kind of baggage considered, I still think that this is a good deal for the Ducks because, like you mentioned, Brandon Montour wasn't a first-round pick. They got a first-rounder in return on top of the first-rounder that they already have this year and they get Brendan Gooley, who's 21, who to me looks already as, I mean, who already has some of the gifts that Montour is held, heralded for and who has room to grow. And so to me, all things considered, it's a little weird to ship out a guy in Montour who's been such a face around the franchise for a few years now. But this is actually a pretty good deal by Bob Murray. I have to say, we talked about this on our, on our trade deadline pod at the Patreon page, but this is... I think the Ducks did well here. Yeah, and so for we had a couple of people in our Twitch chat ask um, what Gooley's contract is like. So he's on his entry level deal still. So he's making six hundred ninety seven k um, for this year and next, and then he's RFA. So. Yeah. So I, and so that's the thing is they're they're buying they're buying youth. They're buying a little more time to evaluate. Um, it'll be interesting, but. I think that to your point about the the left side, right side issue, it is going to be interesting where they go from here because now they basically got no one on the right side after Manson. Yeah. Um, Ikalko Warrior 22 brings up, or actually let me get these two because these are both in the Twitch chat and both are kind of relevant to this trade. Bren, your friend asks, anyone know of any good prospects that are in the 15 to 30th range that we could possibly range that we could possibly pick? I don't know specific ones. I do know that the draft kind of does fall off a bit 
in the bottom half or bottom portion. So the higher you can get in it, the better pretty much. So that's why if it can be the blues pick, that would be very, very good. And then Ikalka Warrior 22 said, wouldn't have been better to shift shift out or ship out, sorry, a left-handed shot D-man. And I well, think... Well, oh, yes. I mean, logically speaking, Logically. Yes, and the, so I... But the thing is that their, their, their left-handed D were harder to move. I mean, Lindholm more term and not a guy you're willing to trade unless it's at a steep price. And then Fowler, obviously the no trade plus the term Montour, like you mentioned earlier, is just an easier guy to move. Yep. And so do you have any other thoughts on Montour? Cause I think that that question right there is a good transition point to something I wanted to bring up. Let's let's go. Let's so go. Bob Murray had a quote that came out during the game. Pretty much the ducks tweeted it out. Um, <laughs> basically about the deadline, different things like that. He said, we're moving forward, getting younger. It, and then parentheses, the Montour trade was just the first piece of what we're trying to do here. The pieces might not make sense at the moment, but they're going to fall into place as time goes by. We're going to change this team over a little bit. And so as dumb as this wow. sounds, as someone that's been critical of Bob Murray a fair amount this year, that's the exact type of statement I've kind of wanted to see come out from him. And that's exactly what I want to see because quite frankly, as a Calco warrior said, wouldn't have been better to shift out a left-handed shot D. That was my biggest concern because on the left side, right. you now have Hampus Lindholm. You have Cam Fowler. You have Jacob Larson. You have Jacob Megna. If you want to consider him also as a prospect, Josh Mahura. you've got Josh Mahura. Also you've got, if you want to consider Trevor Murphy also in the AHL uh, all right. on the right-hand side, you have, Josh Manson, basically. Andy Wolinski. Yeah. Corbin so, and Holzer. Jake Dobson. My, my point still stands. <laughs> my point still that stands. Disparity. So <laughs> I think yeah. it's a bit confusing with where the puzzle pieces lie. So I think that that's refreshing. And I think what that means is, I don't know if specifically that means a left-handed shot D-man gets sent out, mm -hmm. but I think that that could happen. I think a Cam Fowler could possibly move. Um, well, well one thing that we've that we've said about Bob Murray over the past year going back to the sweep against San Jose is that it feels like he knows or understands what's wrong with this yeah. team. So that's never been the issue. Well, but it, now the question is acting upon it. Well, it's not only that, but it seems like at least I've made mention of this a couple times now. I don't mind Bob Murray as a general manager. I don't think he's a bad general manager. I don't think he's the best out there. I think no. that weirdly his blind spot is Randy Carlisle. I think because friendship, things like that, they can blind you. Loyalty can blind you, things like that. Um, I think he's a good general manager, though, overall. And so I think that maybe him being able to assess the situation, I'm willing to give him a year or so. I think I mentioned this on a pod to kind of see what he can do with this current situation, if that yeah. makes any sense. I mean, there's not a whole lot else to take away from the Montour trade. I, I think that ultimately it's it's kind of still jarring to me that a guy who less than a year ago just it felt like he was kind of the toast of the town, you know, a guy who was producing, uh, you know, the high flying style, and now all of a sudden he gone. I mean, it's yeah. just it it's crazy to me. Yep. Um, now that being said, again, I maintain that this is a good deal, and I've only watched one game of Ghoulie, and I'm. I'm fine with people saying that it's that it, I haven't looked at him enough or whatever. I think he already looks just as good yeah. and he's younger. Yep. I and, mean, he, he showed his offensive and, instincts being able to jump into the play. I think he handled himself mm -hmm. well in the defensive zone of the ice. He, mm -hmm. he finished the night with a pretty good Corsi four percentage. I actually just closed the tab. Um, I'll get it up real quick to kind of relay those stats, but he finished the night really good. I think he was on the ice for no high danger chances against also, which he is played a, well, which is a good sign, especially because a knock of cam Fowler is Fowler has been, I mean, let's be real. He's been poor at defending the front of the net. And so a lot of times the, the front of the net gets exposed with cam Fowler on the ice and with Brandon Gooley being, or yeah, Gooley, uh, being his partner for pretty much two of the three periods tonight, he finished the night with a 57% Corsi 4 percentage. He finished the night with a 73% scoring chance, 4 percentage, with 11 scoring chances, 4, four against. And he had two high danger. It was on the ice for two high danger chances against, or four, two high danger chances, four, and none against. And then one thing you notice, he had five shot on, shots on goal. 
Mm-hmm. He had five shots on goal, five shot yeah, attempts. Yeah, he led. The, he 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 led the team in his first game. Every now, every obviously an injury riddled team, but yeah, still every single shot he had or shot attempt he had went on goal. Which we focus on Corsi for 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 looking at the way the play is being driven, different things like that. But making sure the puck gets on net, especially as a defenseman, is an important thing because that can create rebounds. It can create a whole lot of havoc in front of the net. And every single one of his shot attempts went on goal and two of them were scoring chances. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Jordan Samuels, Thomas writing about Brandon Montour and all of his gifts and this and that. And one thing that even he himself mentions is that Brandon Montour is a forward when he got drafted or around, around draft time. And adjusting to the blue line has not been the most seamless transition for him. And so, in a way, I think that it just it worked for Brandon Montour in the AHL. But the adjustment to the NHL, it just seemed to be, I don't know, maybe a little too much. Yeah. But I am, cu- I, I am curious to see him in Buffalo. You know what's really interesting to me about this, this trade for Buffalo? Because we haven't really talked about No, I haven't really thought about but- it. I haven't thought about it a whole lot not, for Buffalo, to be honest. And not, not, not that anyone cares to hear this, but I'm going to say it anyway. One thing that I find interesting from a Buffalo perspective is that Jason Botterill, the GM, in their press conference, talked a lot about the need for puck-rushing defensemen. It's like, you guys have Rasmus Dahlin, and you have Rasmus Ristolainen, and you have all these guys who can rush the puck. How how many puck rushing well, defensemen do you need? You know what's going to be interesting? Who's his coach? What? Well, currently it's Phil Housley, who was a great, great offensive defenseman. Yeah, yeah but I mean, how has he graded out with uh, the defenseman on his own team? I, I mean, mean, he, he was did, he, he was, did well in Nashville. I was about to say he did but, well in Nashville, so. It may be good for but, for but, Montour. But did, did 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 he do well in Nashville, or are all those guys great already? That's, I don't know. That's always. I don't the, know. I I mean, Ryan Ellis was great in junior. Roman Yossi, great. PK Subban. I mean, you already know how I feel. So I I don't know. Matthias it, Ekholm. It, it's gonna be Matthias Ekholm. That's maybe the one you could give him credit for, but. Look at the look at the blue line that uh, the Sabers have. I mean, Marco Scandella, Rasmus Dahlin. Um, you have these guys who are certainly puck rushing defensemen, and so they're really going for this angle, which is kind of interesting to me because, on one hand, Jack Eichel, Jeff Skinner, these are guys who are great at carrying the puck over the blue line. Now, obviously, they don't play the entire game, but it's an interesting fit, nevertheless. By the way. Brandon Montour will be wearing number 62 with the Sabres. Yeah. Thoughts on that? Uh, 62? I mean, yeah. it's the exact flip version of what he wore with the Ducks. He can't go back to 71 because Evan Rodriguez has 71 ooh, for the Sabres. Ooh, ooh. Yep. Yeah. I guess so. I guess that's why. Um, All right. So we, we have one more trade. Two well, more trades to talk about yes. for the Ducks' perspective. Yes. Trade deadline day. Yes. So the two trades, you want me to go for them? Because it sounds like you're you're making me go for them. You've got the biggest trades of the day. The biggest trades, bigger than Montour. You got Brian Gibbons getting shipped to Ottawa. Great duck. <laughs> Had a great season. What do you have? Five points. Five points. This Dearly season? beloved. Dearly beloved. Oh, how we'll miss how we'll miss him. Oh, I don't know how the Ducks are going to move on without him. And they got, I actually don't even remember the player's name, who they got back. Sealing? Seeloff. Seeloff. Patrick Seeloff. Patrick Seeloff, who is most the famous. The man who injured. <laughs> yes, go ahead. The, the person who is most famous for, in a preseason scrimmage, injuring Clark MacArthur and Bobby Ryan going and fighting, and Chris Neal wanting to also fight after the fact, and they had to escort him off the ice for his own safety. Hey man, he's great. Although I will give CJ some credit. CJ and Grit, Gritloff. CJ in, in the article where he broke down the trade did mention that he was the captain of the Belleville Bulls. It seems like all that kind of had been put into the past and um he he's kind of been renamed or kind of put that all behind. Belleville him. Bulls. Put that Grit behind. Franchise. Him. Oh. P- 
TK Subban, this Zelma ran, Mater. randomly popped in my head on Ghoulie really quick. Um, supposedly he won the fastest skater competition in the AHL All-Star game or something like that. Yes. Uh, I think Drake Batherson won that. Or he was, so he was second. Or no. Or was it Ghoulie? I think it was Ghoulie. Shoot. I may be 0 for 2 either way. But yeah, he's, he looks fast. Yeah. And he uh, looks efficient in his stride. Yeah. Okay. So, and then the other big, big trade, the other big trade, the Ducks. The biggest. The, the, the person who definitely had made a huge impact on this roster. Only on the team for 10 games or so, but always going to be number one in our hearts. Michael Delzato. Gone <laughs> to the St. Louis Blues for a sixth round pick. The Ducks got him for Luke Shen and or traded Luke Shen in a seventh round pick for him and got a sixth round pick back. Take that as a win. Yeah, that's that's bargain Bob. Ducks legend element. is uh, how Uvmol said it. Bargain Bob in his bag. Yeah, uh, you know that was. Um, I mean, there's really not a whole lot to say about these other trades. No, I mean it we was can, just. We, we can talk about the rumblings. Obvious flips. The, there were rumblings out there that uh, Adam Henrique's name was being thrown out there. That that he was. I I, I, I think that, that that was too big of a deal to orchestrate. Yeah. I think that that was the problem. Supposedly, I think I saw Nashville and Boston were linked to him. So interesting there. Yeah. Um, maybe that gets revisited at the deadline. The Ducks are gonna need to move some salary out, so that would make a whole lot of sense. Silverberg. To... Silverberg not traded. Not traded. My less let's than one. Per- let's, let's rub that into Jake's my, face. My less than one percent chance. Less than one percent chance. <laughs> uh, Tagging issues and no more. Tagging, Tagging issues. Be- yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. Anything else from the trade deadline you want want to mention on the Ducks' perspective? I mean, I mean, I mean, really, this was a probably quieter than expected deadline from the Ducks. I think that they did make a move, which I think. I, I think that getting out of this deadline with another first was something that Bobbery had to do, especially in a season like, you know, in a season like this. Um, he didn't do it with Jakob Silverberg, but he did do it with Brandon Montour. And I know that the cap constraints are there, but I think it's, it's almost like a wash to me. They get a first, they get a prospect. That's something that they would have gotten in a Silverberg trade, hypothetically. We actually don't know that because second rounders seem to be the flavor of the day for every trade. Um, so maybe they traded a, an asset that had maybe a little more value. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I think you could argue Montour had more value than Silverberg. Give, give me a grade on the trade deadline for the Ducks. Ooh, wow. Well, if I'm grading what they did, if I'm grading what they actually did, I think that I'm giving them a, probably a B plus. Oh, I just meant B overall the trade de- the trade deadline, not just what they did, just the overall their deadline as a whole. Well, what they did and didn't do is probably the bigger issue, and I think that. Ooh, all I, right, so I, I you want you I'm want my gra- you want my grade? I think I know what you're going to give them. What? C minus. No, I was going to go B minus. B minus. Okay. All right. Okay, that actually makes me feel better about what I was going to say. I'm going to go B because I know they didn't trade Henrique. I know they didn't trade Silverberg. But I think if you look at what they got from Montour, to me, that's almost enough. Yeah. That's almost enough because this is not a team rebuild. This is not a team that's, you know, Ottawa esque, that's just completely tearing it down, trading everyone. I think they did okay, all things considered. Yeah, I think they did okay. Also, I think that B minus is probably the right grade because it was a it, it was better than passing. I think pat passing. Right. Or, I think below passing would have been not doing anything, not going going into mm. this draft with no picks at all. I think they now have an extra first mm. round pick. They got a sixth at least for Delzato, which is something. Now it could have been more if they would have sold off a couple other assets, a la Ryan Miller, a la Jack Silverberg. That would have mm-hmm. taken it up to an A. I think Adam Henrique was kind of one of those deals that I was dreaming about, it, but it's not anything I would consider. Tough deal to orchestrate with, with, with five years on the term. Yeah, and so it's one of those things where, yes, I said that you could get a really good return if you do it now as compared to the draft, but I don't think I'm factoring that into my grade because that's not what that's not necessarily an expected trade 
from a, a team selling in a retool. That's kind of more an out there type of deal. And so I think the expected trades are Silverberg and Miller. Granted, Miller kind of blocked mm-hmm. them a little bit because they went, they actually well, went to he's, a, he's He's got the no trade. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And so he didn't want to move. And so that's fine. I mean, that's up to him. Uh, so not moving Silverberg also, but I mean, for the most part, they did fine. I, I think overall it was a fine trade deadline from the Ducks. I think the B range, if you tell me anything from B minus to B plus, I won't, I won't fight you yeah. on it. Um, basically is how I feel about the trade deadline. Before we get into questions, let, I want to mention kind of the roster move type of stuff. The thing that we mentioned at the top, the AHL transaction type. This is Jake's biggest concern of the day. Oh, it's 100% my Without biggest concern. I don't know how this isn't everyone's biggest concern. It, it's such a like, yeah, it's so big. It, it's a, it, it kind of sort of matters. Kind of. It doesn't, but continue. It kind of sort of matters. So essentially, as I've mentioned on previous right. shows, you're allowed or for a guy to be eligible for the AHL playoffs, he has to be on the AHL roster by the trade deadline. And once the trade deadline has passed, you get four call four non-emergency call-ups. And I did actually confirm if a guy is on an emergency recall, he does not have to be sent down um, in order to meet those requirements. So a guy like a Kevin Boyle, a guy like an Angus, Angus Redman, they're still eligible for the AHL playoffs due to the fact that both of them are with the Ducks on an emergency basis. What that means, uh, for those of you out there that don't know what an emergency recall is, essentially if the Ducks don't have enough healthy players for 12 forwards or six defensemen or two goalies, if it's one less than any of those, they can call up anyone Um on an emergency basis in that role. So if they have five defense, healthy defensemen, if one of their defensemen gets hurt, so they can call someone up. And then once that six defenseman does get healthy, that person has to immediately be sent down or, or else it counts as one of the recalls. Um, so Ryan Miller was not good to go today. So Redmond, Redmond was with the ducks and suited up. He's emergency as is Kevin Boyle simply or because John Gibson and Chad Johnson are both injured. Um, so it came out before the Ducks game that Sam Steele was sent down and actually sent down to mm-hmm. be eligible for the AHL playoffs and play with the goals. And then on top of that, you had Jones, Terry, Megna, and Gooley uh, sent down in a pure paper transaction. What that means is they were sent down prior to the noon deadline then called right back up. That's allowed on deadline day. So they were not technically ever... Physically so moving. So they're eligible for the AHL playoffs. They're eligible for the AHL playoffs. Here's the kicker. If all four of them were actually called back up, there goes all four of your recalls. Now, it's p- possible I, there's no confirmation out there whether Terry or Jones are emergency recalls because Getzloff is hurt. Without Ryan Getzloff, the Ducks are at 11 forwards. Um, so one of them could be emergency my concern is that the Ducks are at minimum roster size pretty much right now. They have 12 healthy forwards, six healthy defensemen, three healthy goalies. So essentially what this means is one of Troy Terry and Max Jones are going to be with the Ducks for the rest of the season. Maybe. And what? Maybe. I mean, they have to be unless the Ducks want to ice 11 forwards. I don't know. Patrick Eves. They can't. They, and- it, they, they don't have any recalls. Enter Patrick Eves. They he's, can't. he's technically, is he technically on a, is he actually sent down? Yeah, he was. Because he Cap cleared, Friendly he lists cleared, him. He cleared waivers. Cap Friendly lists him as buried. Yeah. That's how it works. <laughs> he's he's a buried contract because he cleared waivers and was sent Sorry. down. So there's a lingering cap hit of whatever his salary cap hit was minus essentially a million dollars. Kiefer Sherwood. They can't call anyone up, Felix. Adam Cracknell. They can't call anyone up, Felix. Um, so you're saying that one of them, but like, but is that so wrong? I is mean, that such a problem. Look, I want to come clean. I want to come clean to our audience, to our <laughs> listeners. Well, I've been misleading you. So I've been, I've been holding for a long time that I think that they should be in the AHL. For the playoffs, and generally that's not a bad, uh, you know that that's fine. But the more I've thought about it, the more I think, you know, a guy like Troy Terry, especially, 
or even a Max Jones or whoever, if the goal is to have them be NHL players, they should probably be playing NHL games against NHL players and NHL teams. So on one hand, yes, I, you know, I would love to see a goals playoff run and to see them succeed. But at the end of the day, a farm team is just that a farm team, you grow the crops and then the the big club comes in and collects for its own benefit. Um, It's unfortunate, but that's the way it works. Really quickly, Steve asked, I thought that, or he said, I thought you can recall in our Twitch chat. I thought you can recall, but then the players out of the playoffs in the AHL. So no, you're only allowed four call-ups. It's, it's not an AHL eligibility thing. It is a, that is a hard rule. You're only allowed four call-ups per the CBA. You cannot go over that. All the rest have to be emergency. Welcome so, to the NHL, Max Jones. So essentially, Max Jones and Troy Terry, If essentially, if neither of them are emergency, if one of them is sent down once Getzloff is healthy, no one can be called back up for the rest of the year. Black, Even, or what, what is it called? Aces? Black that ha- so black black aces? A- black aces happens that happens due to the fact that the the that's that, playoffs that no that rule happens so that the four call up rule happens when uh it, it goes away when the AHL team has been eliminated from the playoffs pretty much or their regular season ends and they don't make the playoffs well, so that that rule keeps going even into the NHL playoffs if the AHL team is in a playoff race yes but here's the other thing there's nothing that says that the, the goals are going to be in the Calder Cup final. No, I feel like we're, but we're, 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 we're treating that a little bit no, like just a fait accompli, yeah. which it is not. But here, here's the thing is, do you, what's more important? And I guess this is what it comes down to. What's more important than playing in the NHL or them being with the goals in a playoff race and making the playoffs? Cause I mean, Hon- honestly, here, here's what I think. Yeah. Here's what I think specifically. I think that it, it varies player by player. I think that for Troy Terry, it benefits him more to stay in the NHL because I think that that's what he needs to get used to. He needs to get used to the speed and the physicality because that's ultimately where he's gunning for. Max Jones is a little different because I think that Max Jones, he needs reps more than anything. He needs to be playing hockey as long as possible this year because he's missed some time. And so for him... I already see an NHL ready player with him. If I'm the Ducks, I just want him getting reps at this point. It's less important where that is. And with San Diego, he's going to get probably a more extended look. I mean, they're six. They're in sixth place in the Western Conference, and they are six points out of the out of the uh, of, uh, of the ninth seed. So they're they're pretty much in. I mean, it's, well, they the would way, have to the, really fall it, out. It's pure divisional in the AHL. I'm just double checking this actually out of curiosity. And it's set up. Oh, okay. It's set up where it's the four teams from each division uh, make the playoffs. So I think it's one... the top four. So they're in. I mean, they're. I mean, I mean, Tucson has fifty six points yeah, as the fourth four. seed in the Pacific Division. Yeah. So I mean, they're they seem to be safely in. But that being said, I think it, the 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 need per prospect varies, and I think for Terry, he to me has more to gain in the NHL than the AHL. Yeah. Because you see him in the AHL, he dominates or he yeah. he he puts up points. And I think that what he needs to learn, the things that he needs to improve are things that not can only be learned in the NHL, but I, that I think can be accelerated learning in the NHL. Yep. So a, a change of tune for me. They, they there can, you go, folks. They still will probably be down there if the goals are in the playoffs, which like we said, yeah, they should be. They'll I, I be mean, there for it, the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if they can swing it, then I don't see why not. That being said. Yeah, I'm, I'm so, just speaking hypothetically if the choice is between one or the other. Yeah, so and the Ducks are only at six defensemen. And so here's actually an interesting one. Jacob Magna, tonight was his 10th game since he, he cleared waivers last. So now if he gets sent down, which they put him on a paper transaction to make him eligible for the AHL playoffs and he is the goals captain, he's going to require waivers to go back down. Yeah. Whether someone claims yeah. him or not is a whole different story. Who knows there? He won't get claimed. Probably not. But um, the other thing that's interesting is by the Ducks keeping their I, – I think it's interesting they didn't call up Schuster and just at least have seven defensemen consistently because mm. Fire Carl in our Twitch chat brings up the issue with the whole recall thing is that if a defenseman gets hurt right before game time or in warm-ups, 
The Ducks are screwed and have to play shorthanded with five defensemen. They have little to no flexibility right now. Yeah. I mean, mean, is that that such a bad thing? That's a good thing. Uh, Steve Hawking said, no, there are still waivers. Waiver waiver rules definitely still apply. Waiver rules don't just not apply because it's after the deadline. Waivers still matter. Total aside, but apparently the Panthers try to get Mark Stone today. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Any other questions you want to get to here? Um, Well, we haven't even hit questions. So if anyone has questions, start throwing them into the Twitch chat. We'll do anything on the Ducks trade deadline tonight's game anything like that so for those of you watching the recorded version of this on youtube or listening to the recorded version of this on any of your favorite podcast services whether that be soundcloud stitcher apple Podcasts, any of those we i or i actually got the podcast on stitcher recently so for anyone that uses stitcher it's there now um welcome to the family yes um but we do a live version of this show after each and every time after each and every game um we do it at twitch.tv slash Anaheim calling SBN where you can actually support us in a way that's completely free to you. If you have Amazon prime, you get one free Twitch prime subscription each and every month. You do have to hit that subscribe button after 30 days. Um, if you have done it in the past, but that Twitch prime sub helps out a lot more than you can imagine. And with that, you get a special badge next to your name and you get special emotes in the chat. It's a little fun thing to do and it really helps out the show a lot. So if you want to do that for us, it would help a lot. And so we're going to start jumping into questions from the Twitch chat. So Steve Hawking go. gave us a question earlier on in the Twitch chat that I saw and kind of earmarked that said, now with everything considered, what would you say as to Silverberg's value? Because I was very hard set that he got a first round pick. I don't think he would have gotten a first rounder today. Cause I, cause the guys, the guys who did get first rounders were guys with term. But Silverberg not meeting that criteria. It all dep- I guess it I guess what it depends is how do we equate two seconds or a second and a third. I, I, I think that if Silverberg had been traded today in that hypothetical not real world, I think that he would have gotten a second, a prospect, and maybe a lower pick. I don't think he would have gotten a first. Which I mean I, if it, if he got a decent prospect in return, I'm good with that though. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that's a bad return. I mean, I was a huge fan of the Mark Stone deal, and the the Senators did not get a first-round pick in that. So that's absolutely fine. Now, um, the one deal that did involve first-rounders is Matt Duchesne. And it's interesting because if you look at the rest of the trade deadline day, well, I mean, I, I still think you... Columbus needs to give up a first-rounder there, Who... but that— that almost looks like an, not an overpay now, but they they definitely went for it with that trade. Who would you rather have, Kevin Hayes or Jacob Silverberg? Wow, that's a good Cause question. Because Kevin Hayes got a first rounder and Brandon Lemieux. That is true. I mean, oh God, that is a hard. That's question. the interesting thing is it depends. I, I guess Kevin it really depends Hayes on the team. Also, Kevin Hayes is also UFA. I believe now you're making me do research. Why must you do this to me? I mean, it wasn't my fault. Someone else brought him up in our uh, Twitch chat. Kevin Hayes is younger than Jakob Silverberg. He's also having, a, I mean, he's having a pretty good season. 42 points at 51 games. Yeah, he also got a first I, I, and Brandon Lemieux. I just think that Kevin Hayes has more value this season. I don't think that Silverberg is getting you a first rounder this season. Yeah, uh, I could see him getting a first, but it would have to be a first only. And it would have been there would have been some condition attached to it. Probably. I mean, look, I think that who would I rather have? I'd probably have Kevin Hayes, but that's not a slight on oh, that was, Silverberg. That it, was Piggy it, Seven it, Swat's question in the Twitch chat, the the Silverberg and Hayes comparison. Yeah, I, I think I'd rather have Hayes, but not because I, I think lowly of Silverberg, just because Hayes is younger and you know, that that whole jazz. Yeah. Um do 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 uh, Jay Nop said, are you guys happy with the result of today? I think overall, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm neither happy nor sad. Yeah, you're not a fan of the team, so you don't get to speak on being happy or sad. I on just it. like Brendan Goulet. Yeah. 
His name, God, God. Uh, I'm happy. I, I think overall it was a, a decent, decent trade deadline, decent trade deadline for the Ducks. It wasn't great, wasn't terrible. Um, they they came out pretty good. You gave you, you gave it a B minus. I gave it a B minus, and overall, they played. They didn't play great tonight. They didn't play bad. They lost. Tankathon went well. New Jersey won. L.A. lost in overtime. <laughs> um. Edmonton lost in overtime. So all the teams kind of right around the Ducks in the, the tankathon race picked up points while the Ducks did not. So in the tank race, great night. Great night. Great yeah. night. Um, let's see. Um, Bren, your friend said, can we revisit the Cogs for Shore trade? Do you think Shore has a role with this team's future? Do I have to answer this question? Go for it. You have to. I ask I, the questions, then you have to answer, and I get to pick if I get to answer or not. I don't think that that trade is... I mean, who knows what they could have really gotten for Cogliano, but they made the classic mistake of trading in the NHL. They traded Andrew Cogliano at his lowest possible value. I mean, in his worst shooting season, when the team is god-awful, and... At, and at that point in the season, they were truly awful. Um, they were never going to get anything back for him. If they had traded him maybe now where you give him some time to pick up the, pick up a few goals, the team wins a few games, then maybe you get something for him. But um, that's not going to go down as a great trade for the Ducks. And again, I'm not saying Andrew Cagliano is this world beater or that Devin Shore is bad. I just think that they could have probably gotten more. Zen just, a- because Dev- just because Devin Shore is younger – and has a cheaper contract doesn't make him this ne- this like far superior asset. Yeah, uh, Zen- <laughs> Zen- Zen's eight mentions Shore versus Sherwood. Um, wow, I'm gonna go with Sherwood. Stick think, to your gut. I think I'd go Sherwood also, but that's definitely 100 yeah. percent a completely biased opinion, and I'm completely admitting that. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean Shore is fine. You know, he's just that's the thing with he's him. He's, what, just he's a there. Beige. He's there. He he's just a beige just fine player. Yeah. I don't think he moves the needle either way. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Navarrete on Twitter at Strider 64, 25 said question for you. And we kind of mentioned these comments, but what do you think of Bob Murray's comments on the state of the team? What's your opinion on that, on that statement? Uh, the one that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's again, it, it, it's Bob weirdly seeming very cognizant of where his team is at. It's it's almost like it's every once in a while we get this like little statement, this little thing from him making it seem like, oh, I know exactly what you guys are thinking and I'm on the same page. He's throwing Jacob Bone. Oh, yeah. It's it's that, he, he listens he listens to this podcast. He hears all that I go through, all the suffering, and wants <laughs> me to just feel a little bit better. It was definitely directed at me specifically. I'm gonna take all the credit for that statement. So the Florida Panthers tweeted a picture of Roberto Luongo uh, celebrating in front of a crowd tonight. Why? And and the caption is, this is a mood. Like, you know, th- just like this big win. And then I looked at the standings and they are... They're worse almost, than the... Aren't they at the... They're almost where they're the Ducks all, they're, are? They're, they're, eight, they're eight points out of the final wild card spot. So, anyway... Total aside. Um, yeah, so Tankathon update for everyone. Standings. Here we go. I'm, I'm going to go from the bottom up a bit right now. Ottawa Senators still in last place. 49 points in 62 games. Los Angeles Kings next. 53 points in 62 games. Then the Detroit Wet Red Wings. 55 points in 63 games. Then the Ducks with 57 points in 62 games. Then the Devils at 58 in 63 then the Oilers in with 59 and 62, and then the Canucks with 60 and 62. I didn't realize the Canucks were actually that close to the Ducks. So this was a big, big, uh, big situation in terms of the tank race. Well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the Western Conference playoff race has kind of started to, I, I think that we're past the narrative of, oh, anyone can make it. The, the Ducks have 57 points. They are nine points out of the final wild card spot. Yeah, there they're are. Out. There are five teams ahead of them, not including the Minnesota Wild, who hold the la- the last spot. Um, and even for a team like Edmonton, I mean, they are seven points out. 
Chicago five points out. I mean, really, to me, it's a three horse race between Minnesota, Colorado, and Arizona. Also, for don't, that last spot. don't look now on Arizona. Six points back of Vegas with a uh, game in hand. Well, that is the great benefit that that Arizona has is that they are in the Pacific Division. Yeah, and I guess you could say the same for Vancouver, who's only a point behind. Is that they they have that kind of release valve with the third spot. But with the Vegas Golden Knights acquiring Mark Stone, I don't see them relinquishing that third spot. Yeah. All right. So just for fun, let's end the show with something we've been doing of late. Tankathon. First try. Devils won. Oh, Ducks got third this time. Oh, nope. Didn't do anything. This Something that... What, what is... Is we there we go something that jake has been doing something that jake has been doing of late to keep himself sane in this season wait well hey look it, at that canadian's 15th pick when it when I'm, it comes when it comes to the draft it's a we situation because it's my heart it's my all my heart it, it's everything i can hope for it's all the hope i have S, sj hawking saying on the monitor trade i feel like we are getting the the ducks are getting the sj pick Ooh, I'm so that would mean what he's saying is, I don't know. St. Louis is ending up pretty high up in the standings. They're currently in 12th. So that would be, yeah, that's going to be 19th. I think is where that's going to, I mean, here, here's my thing with, with that pick is that I want to see the ducks try to use these two picks to get into the top three if they don't get it out of the lottery. Yeah. If Just you do it. Trade trade a five and a late. The late the late pick and the five to get into the top three. Why yeah. not? Yeah. I mean if they go, go for broke. Yeah. So the blues right now I think sit with the nineteenth pick, but it obviously depends if they that depends on who loses early on in the first rounds and things like that. Although I think that, that means that nineteenth is the best that they can do. Um, so if they drop back a little bit more, um, by going deeper, things like that. So I think we're all blues fans for the next little bit, hoping they get a better, uh, better finish. Your blues. My blues. It Steve mentions they need the, they need St. Louis to improve. I mean, they've been on a hot streak. Yeah. And they're, they're legitimately good. It's not just that they're, they've been getting goaltending, but their underlying numbers are great as well. They're eight, one and one in their last 10. So let's end on this note. We we've talked a lot about the Ducks. Just just give me some quick hitters about deadline day because this was a fun one. Uh, quick hitters. I think let's just go with our winners and losers as we did this on the Patreon pod. We won't really dive into why, but I think yeah. Columbus is a big winner. <laughs> Nashville's a big winner. Yeah. And wait, who is my? I think Ottawa's a big winner. For different reasons. For different <laughs> reasons. Um. Who else was a big winner that I had? I can't even remember now. Even you t- though we just did you recorded. say Vegas? I don't think... Ve- I mean, Vegas is a winner. I don't think they're a big winner. I think Mark Stone is a huge ad because they didn't have to give up anything from their current lineup. I mean, unless Oscar Lindbergh. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. This is this is shaping up to be one of the best playoffs in yeah. recent NHL history. Let, let's hit Every the- team is stacked. Let's hit these two things real quick. Uh, Steve Hawking said, or not Steve Hawking, uh, Uvmul said, if the draft is, isn't that deep, do you think teams will go for two later first to give up uh, Hughes slash Kako? Um, I think that the top five is going to be good. So if you do a top five pick plus yeah. a later pick, maybe you can do that. And the other thing was Zena's eight said, who won the thing with you, Felix, and the other guy? So Kyle's the other guy. Uh, I won. As of now, by my I count... Won. It was four me, four for me, four for Kyle, three for Felix. So I've actually, I won. I've actually, I don't trust Felix. least points wins. I don't trust Felix to count correctly. Um, so I've enlisted <laughs> Kyle to do a recount wow. tomorrow. Wow. Okay. Well, on that note, on, on that positive note, let's uh, let's wrap this show up. Thanks a lot, guys, for tuning in tonight. This was a lot of fun. And if you enjoyed tonight's show, I highly recommend that you make a pledge for the month of February to our Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash ACPod. We did an hour special on the trade deadline. We went over every single big trade and the smaller trades and the Anaheim trades. 
we went all in. It was a lot of fun. And tonight's pod, I got to say, was one of my favorite ones this season. Look, I know that it's been a tough season for the Ducks. There's still just under 20 games left, I believe. But we're going to make it as entertaining and as interesting for you guys as possible the rest of the way. That's just, our promise to you guys. Just keep look at, looking at this tankathon board. Just keep envisioning keep look, that. Keep, keep envisioning that. Keep looking at the tankathon board, yes. All right, so on that note, you know the drill. If you've been enjoying the show, make sure to check us out on the Apple Podcast app. Leave a rating and a review. Um, you can also check us out on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash acpod. Check us out on YouTube. Search Anaheim Calling on YouTube, and we are there. So if you're a YouTube listener or your YouTube viewer, whatever you call it, Please check us out there. Like, We're trying to grow that channel. Please, please like all the videos that you're watching if you're enjoying them. And please, yeah, YouTube sub- has this weird algorithm. So like, play by the rules. Like, subscribe. Subscribing actually helps a lot also. Yes. Um, we are also on Stitcher. So if you're a Stitcher listener, we've got you covered now. Um, that's going to do it for us tonight, guys. Social media, of course. Jake is on Twitter at ReindeerGames91. I'm on Twitter at Felix underscore Sicard. Wow, I can barely get that out. It's been a long night. Uh, thanks for listening, day. guys. And we will catch you at the next pod. Talk to you then. Bye.